I would probably say, you know, um, these are going to be talking about like, these are like real crimes. Like, I would imagine that there is probably, it, this is probably going to be triggering to some people. I would assume that this is going to be triggering for sure. These are real cases, uh, real, this is real. These are real people and real crime that has happened. So just be aware, please no DMCA. <gasps> we have captions. At exactly 3.25 p.m. on April 8th of 2009, the dismissal bell rang at Oliver Stevens School in Woodstock, Ontario, <sighs> and hundreds of grade know? schoolers were seen leaving the premises. Yet one eight-year-old was captured on surveillance leaving two minutes later than the rest, An as she had to run back inside to get her mother's butterfly earrings that were left on her desk. Her name was Tori Stafford, and on that Wednesday afternoon, she never returned home. She was reported missing by her grandmother at exactly 6.04 p.m., and a missing persons investigation was launched immediately. Roughly seven hours later, surveillance footage from a local high school was discovered, capturing what police say was the missing child, walking side by side an unidentified woman. Tori did not appear to be struggling in the video, and the woman was described as between 19 to 25 years of age, white, 5'2", and about 125 pounds with a black ponytail. The local police made a public appeal for the woman in the video to come forward, and Tori's grandparents offered a $10,000 reward for her return. A Facebook group dedicated to finding her gained over 20,000 followers in under 24 hours. On April 12th, four days after her disappearance, hundreds gather in Woodstock at 8 p.m. to hold a vigil for Tori, and her mother makes a tearful televised appeal for the return of her missing daughter. Over the following week, Tori's parents are interviewed by investigators, and each of them pass a polygraph test. Police call off ground searches six days after the child's disappearance after finding no clues nor leads. The day after, America's Most Wanted features Tory's case as its top story. On April 17th, the Ontario Provincial Police take the lead in the investigation, and the ground searches recommence. The case was then officially classed as an abduction, not just a missing person. They step up a media campaign by releasing a composite sketch of the woman in the video, and then circulate the image on social media and local news outlets. On May 19th, police attain information that the woman is 18-year-old Terry <gasps> Lynn McClintock, who is already in custody for breaching a probation order for a previous drug violation. She was transferred to the Ontario Police Headquarters and interviewed at roughly 5.30 p.m. by Detective video. Sergeant Jim Smith. She initially denied being the woman in the video and claimed to know nothing about the missing girl, but roughly 45 minutes into the interrogation, she breaks. I think it goes <gasps> right back to what you've said a few times. You didn't want to see it, okay? But that doesn't change the fact that you saw it, okay? And that's what you need to be truthful about. And I know it's hard to talk about. I know it's even harder to talk about than the sex part of it, okay? But you saw it, okay? You know you saw it. And we need to talk about that. When I seen Mike with Tori on his... I'm just going to move my cam real quick. Lab. Like, I, I turned my head because I didn't want to see it. I could hear her calling my name. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry, what? Okay, you know you saw it, and we need to talk about that. When I seen Mike with Tori on his lap, <gasps> like, I, I turned my head because I didn't want to see it. I could hear her calling my name. <laughs> no! She describes in disturbing detail the abduction and killing of Tori Stafford, stating that she lured the girl into a secluded parking space with the promise of showing her a puppy. She was then forced into the back seat of a vehicle that immediately drove away. In the driver's seat was 28-year-old Michael Rafferty, who then drove to a secluded area about 100 miles north of Woodstock. He then proceeded to sexually assault and then murder the 8-year-old, with the fatal injuries being four strikes to the head with a claw hammer. McClintock drew a rough sketch of the area where Tori was killed, which eventually eventually led police to discover the girl's remains. She was found with lacerations to her liver and 16 broken ribs, but her eventual cause of death correlated with Terry's testimony, as was confirmed to be the result of repeated blows to the head with a blunt object. At 7.55 p.m. that evening, Michael Rafferty is arrested and informed that he is being charged with kidnapping and first-degree murder. He is read his rights and then brought to the police headquarters for immediate interrogation.
on in and grab a chair. Oh, that's a, that'll unfold, so that's a blanket for you there. Okay. Tea. I think they might have only put one sugar in it. They got okay. it mixed up. And uh, there's a plain donut there for you. I had a cereal bar, but if you get hungry or anything else, just let me know, okay? If you have any, uh, you haven't eaten since noon? You haven't eaten since noon? Okay. Are you hungry now? I can get you a full meal if you want. Yes, okay. Bacon and eggs, or do you want something I think else? I'm too sick to talk. This okay. Is, this is really nice. That's okay. You can listen. And uh, if you have any questions as we go along, there's no issues there at all, okay? Okay. i got a few things I'll talk to you about. Um, as I told you, my name is uh, uh, Chris. My last name is Lone. And I understand your name is Michael. Now, do you go by Mike or Michael? What's your preference? It doesn't matter. Okay. I'll, I'll probably call you Mike. So unless that really offends you, um, just uh, um, leave it with me. I'm going to go over a few things here today. Okay, Mike? Uh, like I say, don't be shy. Uh, you'll find I'm pretty relaxed, pretty laid back, because I've dealt with this, these types of issues before. The Ontario Provincial Police have a highly trained behavioral sciences unit, and their subdivision of forensic psychiatry is recognized as one of the best in the world. At first, you will see the familiar strategy of rapport development. The investigator will retain a friendly and almost nonchalant disposition throughout the opening phase of the interrogation. That's the why they give him a blanket and food. The perception of solidarity and respect will make the suspect more likely to cooperate and take things They're into consideration. They're trying to make him feel While like he has friends and an ally. While the disposition will also downplay the severity of the crime, thus making the gravity of admission far less intimidating. Anytime that you have a, uh, a question. They need right. info from him. They Don't need like sure. a confession. Now, uh, it's part of the process. I have no issues getting you any food there. So if there's something that you want, okay, I'll get you some food. There's no, no problems. I'll like I say I get that for you in about five minutes. So, um, But my job is, as I mentioned to you, that I'm from what's called the behavioral sciences section. And we're talking about the, uh, the missing person when uh, Tory Stafford went missing. I know you were following a little bit in the media and you follow some little bits and pieces that there was behavioral sciences people involved, right? And sometimes they were um, criminal profilers. Uh, there's been other members in there as well. Threat assessment, and that's what uh, one of my roles is as well. Uh, in threat assessment, what my job is, is to determine the, um, the risk, okay? What's the risk of a certain situation? Now, the situation that we're talking about, is you're going to find here that there's nothing you're going to tell me to surprise me, okay, for two reasons. One, I've heard a lot of this stuff before. Uh, the second reason is I'm fortunate enough to know what the, all the case facts are. Okay, so uh, what I have to do is assess is assess what I perceive is, is a threat. So are you going to go out and kill more people after this this situation is done? Okay, that's what my job is to assess assess threat level. All right, I already know you're you're responsible for one for one death. Okay, so that's what my job is is to determine okay what's happened here. Right. Staff Sergeant Chris Loam had been a police officer for over 21 years and was a member of the Behavioral Sciences Unit for the last 17. At the time this interrogation took place, he was the head of the analysis section. This meant he was in charge of criminal profiling, threat assessment, and forensic psychiatry. He indicates that his only purpose is to assess the suspect's threat level, yet this variety of threat assessment is only applied to less severe infractions. With relation to rape and murder, the serious nature of the crime means that the threat level is already assessed long before any form of psychoanalysis takes place. In reality, mm. the investigator's primary purpose is to gain an understanding of the suspect's character and then use this knowledge to try and influence both his reasoning and decision making. Before we go through all that though, like people just don't wake up one day and decide this is going to happen and I know that, all right? So there's a lot of ideas that go in people's heads at the time and uh, um, if, if I go through, and I, and I have, I go through your history your background, there's not a whole hell of a lot you've been involved in in life, is there, right? You're completely under the radar. Anyways, I gotta go through a few things with you here, all right? Obviously, you're uh, you're upset by what's going on. You're here for a reason, and right back at the beginning, the investigators and the case manager, the officer in charge said that I'm gonna follow the evidence and go where the evidence leads me, okay? And now you're here because the evidence is, has led the investigators to you, all right? And then I get involved after after that, there's been people that I work with uh, in behavioral sciences that have been here from the outset of the investigation. But um, really, probably crying because he got this, caught. At this point in time, I mean, when I go in and look at uh, your history, there's very little on there. Like I say, you've flown under the radar. You haven't had any major problems with the uh, with the police, okay? But now all of a sudden, you're involved in this situation, and it's a serious situation, and it's a scary situation. I'm sure you're. You're quite upset and quite concerned about what uh, what's going on here, all right? Now, the last
last one I was involved with like this, I don't know if you're aware of it, was a girl named Holly Jones in Toronto, and she went missing. And the guy that uh, had abducted her, his name was Michael Breer. And what he, he was doing is he was watching uh, on his computer for hours and hours and hours, he was looking at child porn to the point that he decided. 17 gigabytes of child porn uh, were discovered on Rafferty's hard drive. That's what that says. I want to go try this. And he goes and he grabs Holly and he does some things to her and then he realizes what am I going to do, okay? And he panics. He doesn't know what to do because she's a witness now. And he says, if I just let her go, she's going to tell on me. So he decides that he's not going to let her go, all right? And all that was from something as simple as watching child pornography for hours on end. These things happen, okay? And we can't say it happened close to home. Toronto's not that far from you, okay? These things happen all the time, all right? So what I need to do is sit with you. Um, I already know how. I know the who's, right? Uh, why? I mean, why is up to you, but I can actually probably fill in that blank for you, but that's not what my rule here is. If I'm going to um, assess risk here and see, number one, do you even feel bad about what you've done? That's the first thing I look for. And number two, do I think, okay, he doesn't feel bad, so an attorney's probably gonna do this again because he really doesn't care about it the first he doesn't time feel it's bad. Okay. I'm not at all. I feel like um, people like this only care about themselves. And he's crying you. because he got I'm caught and doesn't want to go to jail. You. You'll know if I don't want to talk to you because I'll just simply leave, right? From, from reading about you, this to me seems like it's out of character. No, I could be wrong, right? Um, you, may have, uh, you may have been playing this for, for a long period of time, and you may have thoroughly enjoyed this. And if I'm wrong, then you tell me that, all right? But I also know that we all make mistakes, okay? And that's why pencils have erasers, okay? Because we all make mistakes. It's that simple. Um, spending time with you here, and if I'm wrong, you tell me. But it looks like if you could turn back time, maybe there's a few decisions in life you'd made a little bit different. All right? If I could turn back time for you, Mike, I would. But it's not that simple, okay? So now you and I have to sit here and face what's happened, okay? I can sit and tell you what happened. I can take you through the day of her disappearance, okay? I mean, I've seen the, uh, I've seen the video, all right? And I know that you didn't do this alone, and, uh, but at the end of the day, we've got to, uh, we've got to deal with this situation, okay? Because it's a, it's a, a young girl that we've got to talk about. And if uh, you and I don't sit and talk about your side, then people will only think the worst, right? It's human nature, right? You've done it and I've done it. We always think the worst until we know the facts, okay? So that's what you and I need to sit here and work and discuss and work through. Again, if I'm wrong, you tell me, okay? But I really believe if you could turn back time, you would deal, this a, deal with this a little bit different, okay? And there may have been a rush. It may have been exciting for a period of time. But then reality sets in, and you have to sit and live with the fact of what's happened here, okay? And that's what we're doing here. We have to sit and deal with what's happened. Really, at this point, what you have left is your word and your credibility. And people always think the worst, okay, until they know the truth. You do it and I do it. It's human nature. So we're all going to think the worst until we know why this has happened in your mind. And again, if it's something where you're like Michael Breer, where you looked at a lot of child porn and then just decided you were going to try it, then that's fine. If it wasn't your idea, then that's fine too. But we can't change what the case facts are, all right? And you know deep down that this is your chance to get it off your chest. You're not sitting there the rest of your life saying, I guess I should have said something, all right? I guess I should have got it off my chest and said my side. Because this is your last chance to do it. The fact that you're here and the fact that... Uh, um, the detective's already, doing a great uh, job. Um, they know where, where the victim is, okay? And they know your steps. This is it. You have to take the steps now to live the rest of your life, okay? No, this is what it's you not you fine, about, but he's okay? he needs to make the guy feel like it's always interesting they're on the to same examine team. A suspect's demeanor while being interrogated, especially compared to how they most likely were while committing their violation. The suspect here is a quivering mess, acting like a helpless victim, wallowing in his own self-pity while vying for sympathy. Essentially the opposite of how he was while attacking Tory Stafford. It's ironic that the powerless and vulnerable complexion he is trying to portray here is exactly what his victim would have felt at the time she was attacked. The sympathy he is trying to garner for himself is clearly what he lacked for the eight-year-old child he raped and murdered. Mm -hmm. I've got to determine He's part acting. Of my job. When all is said and done here, do I think Mike's done? This is it. He's made his mistake. He realizes how wrong he, uh, the mistake that he made, and he's willing to look past it? Or do I have to sit here and say, 
All right, my report's going to say very simple. I think this guy's going to reoffend. The detective sees adults. right through this. These types of situations and the, and the reasons why people do this stuff. Okay, um, like I say, this may have been a thing that uh, you just snapped and did something. That stuff happens, or it may have been something you planned for many months and got some enjoyment out of the plan. I okay. didn't do anything. Well, that's not entirely true. Either. That is okay. entirely true. I no. I didn't do anything. No, you can try and cement yourself into that, okay? But at the same time, you're not doing yourself any good by not being truthful here, okay? The investigator wants to come across as empathetic and understanding, See? yet still needs to keep the suspect's confidence low. He yes. watches for denials and stops them immediately. Letting the mm -hmm. suspect deny his guilt will only increase his morale, thus increase his psychological endurance and constancy for self-preservation. This needs to be stripped away as much as possible, as early as possible. Because by not being truthful, all you have left is your He's credibility. doing so good. This is That's a really good detective. Left. Okay. You're not the only person uh, who's been arrested and charged, okay? And, uh, Morale low? There's no surprises left anymore. Guard okay? down? Only, it's not even a surprise. It's why this happened. You're also not the only innocent person who's ever been arrested and charged. Well, and that's true. There's been people that uh, have been arrested for things where there's no evidence, but unfortunately in this case, there's lots of evidence to determine your role in this crime, okay? The girl who's, who's on the video who walks away with Tori has been identified. And she's been identified of as her and Tori being in your car. And the three of you, you and her and Tori, uh, go to the Guelph area, go to the Home Depot, okay? And, and the grabbing of, uh, of Tori, there was a, was a planned event that you were going to grab her. You were going to grab a girl. Um, but this other person was going to do it, and the other person got the girl. Put her in your car, all right? And, and then there's other steps that are taken from there. Okay, there's things that happen at Home Depot, there's things, things that happen outside of Guelph, and there's things that happen to Tori, all right, before she's gone. And uh, you're involved in that. And you can't, you can't mask that, you can't change it, okay? No, 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 no. Because what's happened has happened. Idiot. I can't turn back the hands of time, and neither can you, okay? There's, uh, there's nothing I can do to turn back the hands of time and say, I wish Mike would have reacted to this situation a little bit differently, okay? There's no doubt in my mind, okay? There's no doubt in my mind that you're involved in the abduction, okay, of Tori. No doubt in my mind at all. I followed the evidence, I've read the file, okay? There's no doubt in my mind. We're past that, okay? And the only concern or the issue that I have is why you did this. What caused you to do this? Was it something you, like I say, is this something you've done before and you've been involved in the death of other people and you enjoyed this? Am I sitting across the, the uh, the desk from Paul Bernardo here? Or am I sitting across from someone who's made a mistake? Okay? And that's going to be the question that's asked of you. All right? I'll get you a bucket there in just a second. You got to get sick and your boots there. Has no okay. sympathy for I've him. I've seen it before. You're not going to offend me or bother me. So if you got to be sick, Mike, go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> I'll get you some paper towels or something. Oh, you're not going to throw up? I feel like just you're going to be sick. Just, uh, just grab the, uh, I'll have the bucket there handy for you, okay? He doesn't need it. Leave it right there. You and I need to uh, to uh, have a discussion. This isn't uh, uh, this isn't a parking ticket, okay? This is uh, this is reality, okay? And people are. I've already told you. You know this. People assume the worst until they know the truth, okay? And people are going to assume the worst of you unless you and I sit here and clarify it. Okay? Something's pushed you to do this. Okay? You don't. You can't just fly under the radar your entire life. Okay, Mike? It doesn't happen. It's not realistic. I'm not going to sit and tell you that it happened. Something brings this on. And when you sit and talk to uh, uh, someone who had a troubled life like uh, Michael Breer and just gets pushed into doing this and panics and thinks, what would it be like to, to take a kid and, and touch and rub a kid? And then wish you could stop, okay? And people can't, and that's the whole issue here. Right. The detective seems to be almost rambling here, but this is a common strategy used to keep the suspect's mind racing. When Rafferty is concentrating on what the detective is saying, it doesn't give him a chance to conjure up his own thoughts, mm -hmm. making it very hard for him to either think up a lie or disassociate from the situation altogether. Mm -hmm. It's a methodical process of breaking a suspect down so through mental exhaustion and slowly chipping away at his psychological stamina piece by piece. We can't control every emotion. All right, we can't control some of our urges, some of our thoughts. None of us can, okay? And I can't look you in the face and say I haven't made a mistake or made a bad decision in life, because I have. But the reality of it is, you and I have to accept that and move on, okay? 
because I can walk out there and never see you again. Like I can do that. He has no right? energy. My job here is done. The job here is done, as you'll find He's out tomorrow. He's putting too much energy um, into his fake acting. As things start to, uh, to be released, um, there is no more questions. There is no more long, drawn-out investigations. They're already sending people home to spend time with their families, okay? They're scaling back what's happened because it's been cleared, and they know what's happened, and the pieces of evidence have been gathered. So that's, that's reality. I can't downplay that. But you and I need to walk out of here wow. together, okay, with what happened. This detective here. You is just... And I have just... to sit and say... This is what pushed Mike. So good with words. This is what pushed Mike to get involved in something like this. Because if I don't, then you sit here on your own and you have to take it. Okay, and is that necessarily fair? All right. I have to sit here on my own anyways and take this. To an extent, you do. Yes. <laughs> then you have to sit there and decide: Am I going to get rid of this and get this off my chest so people understand my side, or am I going to sit there curled up and uh, and keep it in for for the rest of my life? All right. You need to be realistic about this, okay? You have no battle plan to deal with this, right? It's happened, it's spun out of control, and you're thinking, okay, if I ever get caught for it, what am I gonna do? Well, your, your plan isn't gonna work, okay? Because you're not built for this shit. This isn't what you're about, okay? You're not some <laughs> sick bastard, right? That, uh, that sits there and gets enjoyment out of hurting people, all right? So now you have to live with this, okay? And to live with it, one of the first ways, right? It's like if someone's an alcoholic, what's the first thing they have to do? Acknowledge they've got the issue. Right? You have an issue here in that there's overwhelming evidence, compelling evidence, that indicates you're involved in what's happened to Tori. Okay? And no, I can't change that and you can't change that at this stage. Can't change but it. But you need to be honest. He and did you what need he to did. Understand. Your credibility, Mike, is all you have left. All you have left from here on in is your credibility. And you sitting here saying nothing doesn't do you a bit of good because no one's going to know. And then all of a sudden, 10 years from now or 5 years from now, you decide to say something, who's going to listen? Nobody. Okay? No one. This is your chance to say your piece. All right? Like I say, if you want, and you can see probably I'm, I'm trying not to out of respect actually for you, but I can sit and get as um, um, graphic as, as, as I want, okay? Because none of this stuff bothers me because I've seen it hundreds of times, okay? But if I sit and go over what, uh, what's happened here with Tori, you may not be real happy about it because it's going to cause you to relive all this crap, okay? And maybe you want to because I can tell you I've sat with guys that wanted me to say it again so they could hear what they've accomplished. And I've had that where they want me to say it two and three times because they get a rush out of that. I don't think that's you, okay? You're not some sick guy, okay? I'm not sitting across from Paul Bernardo, okay? I know that and I know people that have sat across from him, okay? And I know two officers that have in different stages of their lives, okay? And I know what he's all about. You're not that guy, all right? But at the same time, you can't just sit here and say, well, I hope this all goes away, right? This isn't like a list your girlfriend gives you to say, here's a list of things to do. Can you go pick up a few things at the, at the grocery store for me and get some gas? This isn't what that is, okay? This is a lot more serious than a to-do list. We need to deal with reality. And the reality of it is your credibility is all you have left at this point. If you sit there and say nothing, everybody's going to assume the worst, okay? And you may be painted with a picture that you're not real happy with. Okay? And I'm the only one that feels like sitting in here with you, right? There's no investigators lined up in here sitting with you. Why do you think that is? Right? Because they've been working at this for, for weeks, okay? They're tired and they've been away from their families and none of them want to come in here and talk to you, okay? I have no issue with it. I'm neutral. I don't have these issues. I haven't been away from my family. I don't mind talking to you. Like, I've talked to people that have uh, been involved in things far worse than what they're saying you did here. Far worse, okay? I can sit and list the things that I've been involved in. There are people who have done things that have been a threat to our national security, terrorism in Canada, um, or I've dealt with people that have uh, been involved in murdering more than three people. All right? I've been involved with people who Being have Being a detective is a talent. Taking life of children. I've, I've been involved in it. I've dealt Being with able to tell a man like this that, that you're not as terrible as you uh, think you are. Less children. I've dealt with that. It does not stuff doesn't know. bother me. Okay? The detective. What's going on here is... He's just, just doing his job to get the big, info and bundle of nerves, and you don't know what to do. Get what he you needs. Know whether to sit here, shake, shit, puke, you don't know what to do. But the reality of it is, at the end of the day, the evidence is the evidence. Okay, and the evidence clearly shows you're responsible for the abduction of Tori. He wants okay? him to confess. And I also know that she's no longer with us. Okay, and you're responsible for that too. Okay, and there's a, there's a sexual component to this as well. So you might want to sit and get this off your chest and go through your side with me, all right? Because if I just walk away, at minimum, that's what people are going to think, at minimum. But 
you have some explaining to do. Okay, that's reality. I can't change that, okay? If this is something okay. that got out of control, that you just planned on taking and you thought you were gonna put her back, or just take her for a ride, that's fine. If you get out of hand, then we need to talk about that, okay? okay. You need to sit and explain that and say why, okay? okay? If not, then I say people think the worst until they know. There is no other way. You don't have any other options. There's nothing else that you can do to change what's happened to her. We can't turn back time. However, we can explain how things got off the rails, whether it was something that happened slowly or just went right off the rails right from the from the beginning. Why do you think the OPP has a behavioral sciences section? This is all the stuff that we deal with, okay? We deal with occurrences that are unusual. We deal with situations that aren't regular situations. And that's not what this is. This isn't a regular situation. This is a couple of people that made a series of, uh, of decisions that hopefully they understand are quite right and that they feel bad about. I don't think that you're some kind of monster. If I did, you'll find me pretty candid. You'll find that I'll come right out and tell you, Mike, okay? I don't think that, okay? I think this got out of control. I think it got out of hand, okay? Are you some kind of monster? Or did you make a mistake here? You made a mistake, right? This is a mistake, right, Mike? You'd take it back if you could. This is a mistake, right, Mike? You'd take it back. If you could turn back the hands Science. of time, Mike, would you, take this, would you do this a little bit different? Mike? talking to you. If you turn back the hands of time, you're not some monster. You made a mistake, right? You take this back if you could. This Science. is a mistake, Mike. You need to deal with this. I okay? am no monster, I I know but I did monster. not do what you think no, I did. I know you did. We're past that, okay? Mm -hmm. We're past that, Mike, okay? Mm -hmm. I know you're not a monster. If you did, if I, if I thought you were a monster, I would tell you. I'm not going to, I'm going to be honest with you. I wouldn't just walk out. Science. I would spend some time with you. For that you're a monster just because I want to see what makes you tick but you're not a monster all right this thing is consumed you look at you right you can barely eat or drink you haven't touched your donut right why is that because your guts are eating yourself up inside okay you can't sit and say yeah, he's clearly um, guilty that you're innocent did all, what's the first thing you did when you got in here you just laid down and curled up right it's all over you know it's over okay you know it's done okay you don't have to be an expert in body language. All you've done is lay around in the fetal position since you've been here. That's not mm -hmm. how innocent people act. Mm -hmm. That's not how people that are falsely accused of something act. It's, it's the last that thing it's they do. Possibly that it's, it's freezing. I haven't eaten since noon. It couldn't be that this is all just a huge, huge shock to me. No, it yes. couldn't have been any of that at all. It's probably all of that. But it's also the fact that you're, you're involved in it. It's probably all of that, Mike. Okay, the fact that maybe you haven't eaten that much and maybe you are cold, there's no question. The first thing you said to me was you're cold and hungry. So that's why I grabbed mm -hmm. you that stuff, okay? And I'll, I'm willing to accept that. Maybe that is part of the issue, okay? But there is a bigger, there is a larger issue here, okay? And it's the issue of the evidence and the issue that you're involved in this, okay? And we can't change that. Like, I have no um, uh, ill will, anger towards you. I have none. You don't, uh, you don't make me mad. You don't upset me, nothing like that, okay? Um, okay. The only issue I have is I don't fully understand. I volunteered here to come here and shoot the shit with you because I've talked to people in worse situations than you, okay? And like I say, you've been pretty respectful with me. Um, you're not giving me a hard time. You're not being rude to me. Um, so I'll sit with you because, uh, um, but you know, the reality of it is I can walk away and you're going to sit and deal with this on your own for the rest of your life. You're a smart guy. You're, you're, not, you're nobody's fool. You know, you know the situation. You know you're in a, in a tough spot. And again, this is your opportunity to, uh, to say your piece. But you got some pretty serious explaining to do here, okay? Uh, in the big picture, now without me, if I just leave you here, you got some stuff that you need to explain. I've acknowledged already what my thoughts are of you, okay? I've told you that from the beginning, that this is out of character for you, okay? But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's why you don't want to talk, because maybe you're thinking, hey, you know what, Chris, you're wrong. You know, maybe I've done this before. Maybe I plan on doing, plan on doing it again, all right? I don't think that, but I mean, you could be sitting here playing me, right? How the hell would I know, okay? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that I don't think that's the case because I've sat across from a lot of people, again, that have been through stuff a lot to, a lot worse than you. Um, you made a mistake, man. We deal with it and we move on. Oh, yeah, I hope he confesses. Here. Oh, well, we take a chance. Maybe I'll just leave it and it'll all work itself out. I'm well past that, Mike. This is not gonna work itself out, okay? It's We're not. past that. You need to acknowledge what's caused you to do this. 
eat your donut. I, and I never said for a second that you went and Act that more kid innocent, to school because you quick. did. That kid was taken. <laughs> There's from a that chance. School, all right, by Terry and put it Idiot. in your car. Okay, and you He's were so there, guilty. And, uh, and you were part of when the kid was dri driven to Guelph. Okay, in the Home Depot, uh, and then from there, uh, the kid uh, into the demise of the kid. Look, this is the stuff we need to explain. Nobody can control your destiny now but you. Okay, I can. I mean, I've already told you, I've already put my cards on the table. It's been an hour. This is your chance. Is it time? Do you not think you're going to feel built and feel better getting some of this off your chest as opposed to keeping it there forever? You know what I mean? I'll sit with you and do this. There's no issues with it at all. Like I say, I have no problem sitting with you, man. So why don't we just find a starting point and we'll do it. Because you're going to sit and stew forever. You say, no, I should have said this or shouldn't I have said that, right? It's up to you. I mean, I've got situations where I wish I'd have told somebody something that I didn't. And I regret it my whole life, okay? And it's situations with family members where you should have said your piece or you should have kept your mouth shut. But we all have those experiences. But this is your chance to say your piece, all right? And I think you and I should take that chance. I think you and I should just sit and have that discussion. How is it going to get worse, right? It can't. And obviously, to an extent, someone's put you in this position, right? And we need to deal with that. You want me to tell you things I didn't do so I so I can get locked up for the rest of my life for this? No, that's not how I, I'm not, I don't want you to tell me anything She's you did She's still did trying? No. I'm going to ask you a question. What's your biggest fear or your biggest concern now that you've been charged with this, what's your biggest concern here? Losing my life. Okay. All right. So selfish, huh? So selfish. I want to know what this girl Terry said. Um, okay. She acknowledges that uh, she uh, she grabbed Tori and brought her to your car. That it was your wishes. That you sent her there with certain things that you were looking for in a victim. And she took her. You guys drove on the highway and did the Home Depot thing, which I talked about. Left the Home Depot, um, went to a secluded area. Uh, you had sexual relations with Tori, and Tori was killed. This is your time, man. This is as good as it gets, unfortunately. All right, this is it. And uh, um, I mean, I can get into more detail if you want, but in a nutshell, that's a polite way of saying what the allegations are. But if there's stuff, if there's, if there's other uh, people here. Hey, Let him sit for three hours. <gasps> he drank some coffee. in there for What's happening, man? same guy what's this process what happens what happens next um, after you and I are done talking you go back to your cells um, tomorrow morning you'll have what's called a uh, you'll be brought into court and the charges will be read to you again and there'll be a discussion if you uh, get out of custody for, uh, for bail, and then they may schedule a bail hearing to determine that. And then from there, it, uh, it's a matter of uh, where it goes from the courts. The investigation will go on for a little while yet. There's a couple things that, as I told you, there need to be done. Um, and then in the, the big picture, you're, I mean, you're facing these charges. The reality of it is we can just sit and deal with the issue Ugh. just as easy. I'd rather deal with this issue in court. The suspect remains unyielding after 95 minutes of psychological mm -hmm. pressure, so the investigators commence the next stage of the interrogation. It's time. They initiate the Mutt and Jeff technique, most commonly known in pop culture as good cop, bad cop. Hey, Seth, how are you? Are you? Are you? Oh, uh, oh Blake here we go. To see what uh, Terry Lynn had to say. The bad my, cops. Terry Lynn's still speaking to my partner, okay? This is the girl you killed, all right? Oh, She's not missing shit. anymore. She's dead. 
Terry Lynn was asked today if she wanted to call a lawyer four times. She said no, all four times. She went through two boxes of Kleenex. All right. She says on the 8th of April, Wednesday the 8th of April 2009, at 3.30 in the afternoon, you drop her off at Pavey, south of Fife, south of the public school, where Tori walks out of. You tell her to get a girl, and you want her young. She walks up the street, you drive up to the old age home where you park your car. She walks up to Tori. Tori's nice to her. She trusts her. She holds her hand for a little bit. She walks up the street with her. Terry Lynn tells her about her little dog, gets her across the street to your car, opens the back door. Tori doesn't like it anymore. She pushes her in the car. You start driving. She says she's freaking out. She says she's worried about you. She's scared about what you're going to do. She says you guys hit the 401. You start driving to Guelph. You park outside a house. You go in for a little while. You come out with some drugs, she thinks. And you drive to the Home Depot. You park at the end of the parking lot. You tell her it's her time her turn to get out of the car. You tell her to go in there, you give her some cash because you don't want to use your debit card so you don't track it. She goes in there, she gets garbage bags like she's told to do, and she comes back out. Oh. And you go driving. And you pull into a farmer's field, right across from a house, to the point where you're even asking her if anybody can see you. And what does she do? She says she goes for a walk because she doesn't want to see what happens. And then she comes back and you're not sitting in the front seat anymore Mike you're sitting in the back seat and she's not liking what she sees so she walks away again then she comes back and you make her hold one of those garbage bags while you put some of your clothes and her jacket and a hammer in the garbage bag then you drive to a gas station she never sees Tori again you drive to that gas station you get out you wash up you dump the bag. You drive back to Woodstock. That's Terry Lynn's story, Mike. That's Terry Lynn's story while she bawls her eyes out through two boxes of Kleenex. And I ask her four times, hey, you want to call a lawyer? She says, I don't need to call a lawyer. I feel so bad about what happened. I just want to tell you all about it. That's what you're up against. Terry Lynn's a liar. Well, <laughs> oh, fuck the only you. person who can tell us that, buddy. Oh, I hope this guy and rots. Just, you gotta be careful, though, Mike, because some of the shit she said is backed by uh, not just video but other evidence, but also some of the um, the explanations that she gave as well are verified. Selfish, um, selfish, disgusting that's, uh, scum. That's more graphic than I said, but, uh, dirt of the earth. Uh, yeah, there is some stuff that she says that is true. There's no question. I'm not gonna say, say it's not. But, uh, How old are you, Mike? Twenty-eight years old. You want to tell us your side of the story? Get rid of your fucking security blanket and start being a man. Because it's not going to be her semen that we find on her body. But when we look at the areas underneath the parts of the seat that you security cut out, security blanket. We're going to find her blood. I love Do you know the how bad blood cop. works? Do you know about red blood cells, white blood cells? White blood cells are thinner. They look like spit when they're separated from red blood cells. They're the ones that seep through into the foam. That's what we get the DNA from. Skin cells from her rubbing up and down against your seats in your car. Tori Stafford is all over your car. All over it. What an idiot. And Terry Lynn explains everything that she knows we're going to find. You're explaining nothing. So I don't give a fuck if you say one more word and tell you the truth. All right, we're done then. Well, I'm done with you anyway. Okay. This officer here is trying to understand what the hell you're going through. I don't care. Who are you? I I'm the lead me. investigator here. Okay. Okay. Terry Lynn's full of shit. Well, that's going to gouge gonna be his eyes out. A funny thing for I you to say. I want to take his eyes out and shove because it down his throat. How is the DNA going to be full of shit, Mike? Huh? How's the biologist from the Center of Forensic Science is going to be full of shit? Yeah. How's no. the pathologist that examines her body going to be full of shit? Explain that to me. Bitch.
call him a bitch. Like that's a dangerous road to go on. But there's something you and I can clarify with what she said, then let's clarify it. But we can't just sit here with a blanket statement that she's full of shit because there is some things that's truthful. And by you saying that makes it takes away your credibility. So we gotta be very careful with that. I'm done with him. Yeah. This officer's got his job to do, Mike. He's got a different job than I do. For my investigation, you keeping your mouth shut is the best thing can happen. So keep on keeping it shut. Okay. The theory behind good cop, bad oh my cop God, is known so as good. the fear then relief response. It's believed that when the immediate shift from one emotion to the next is so extreme, a suspect can become disoriented and their ability to think critically can be affected. This specific state of disorientation makes compliance more likely as the rapid change of emotion can evoke the feeling it's of time. uncertainty and a suspect's positive response to an oncoming request is a form of coping with this uncertainty. This is of course not a guaranteed system and a suspect will not always respond in the desired manner. Well, you know more than I told you anyway. Um, it wasn't quite as eloquent as I would have put it, but anyways. Um, at the same time, um, what he's saying is right. Like, I did watch watch what she was saying, and she was very emotional. There's no question. Um, and she did go through Kleenex. There's no question of that. Um, and she was upset. But, and, and there's stuff that she said that, I mean, was clearly known ahead of time by the investigators and their stuff that was said that uh, by her saying it later proved out to be confirmed other ways. So don't, uh, um, not, you know, can't say don't, you can do whatever the hell you want, but just be careful going up that road. Anyways, but like I said, I have no issues on that. That doesn't change my opinion from our discussion, to be quite honest. I mean, they've got their opinions and obviously they're getting sick of listening to me, so, um, so they've come in and said their piece. But like I say, I've got no, uh, I'm not pissed with you, so I'm not to, uh, but like I say, this is your chance, this is your chance to, uh, to say your piece, and, uh, I'm sitting here willing to listen to it. Well, he just told me not to say anything more, so. Well, it's up to you, you don't say anything again. That's else, what he said, though, he, so. He doesn't want you to talk to him, but that's fine, I have, I'm still interested in listening to you. Please. You talk about the part of the school where she's grabbed. discuss that and see what your thoughts are there. I'm not saying any more. Why? Because, because of the officer, because of what the lawyer said, now it's everything. I just don't, I don't. What do you think is going to happen next? I'm not sure. I don't know. Someone runs in here and starts barking. Um. You just want me to say whatever. You just want me to say things. So it's in it's open and closed. No. So it's over and done with. That's it. This is how it is. Nothing more to talk about. No, actually, because I you know actually that's not that's you're, that's fair. That's a very fair statement actually. But, um, but I gotta tell you, in this case, it's not, it doesn't matter. So yeah, I'm compelled and I'm interested to listen to what you have to say. But is it, does it open and shut this case? No. I'm done. Why? Dang it. I'm not talking anymore. How come? I've already told you why. Just because of all the different angles and all that? I'm just, I just don't feel comfortable talking about it. Oh! <gasps> prepared then I just leave it like this and you're gonna write it out from here see where it goes yep you think that's the best way to do it I don't know I've never been in this chair before I don't know mm -hmm. any questions of me He's not comfortable talking about it. He needs something to eat. Yeah, but you don't care if I need something to eat. Why would you say that? Because you don't. I wouldn't ask me. True. Care. You're here for your job. You're nope. I could have walked out. I don't have to ask you to eat because you got a right here. Right? But the reality of it is, 
I know that you're gonna go back and sit and sleep or do whatever for a while and you'd be better to do it on a full stomach. That's all it is to it, man. But I don't have to ask you if you want food, but I am prepared to get you food. So oh, I can reality. eat and then you can say, well, look, he had an appetite. This is how he must have been feeling. Oh, he oh. drank his tea. This is how he must be feeling. Forget uh, the fact he's just starving and... Oh, uh, you're reading too much into it, man. True. No. no you didn't eat the donut, good. you're guilty. I offered you something to eat because I thought if you're hungry, you can eat it. I don't care Dramatic if you eat bitch. it or not, right? I mean, but I hate him so you. much. He's such a pussy. It doesn't matter to me if you eat or you don't eat. And that doesn't go anywhere in any of your reports. <laughs> What's that? That I ate or not ate. No, because it's on the video. It doesn't matter. Eat or not. I don't have to write any report. Dude. My report doesn't say if you ate or not. My report says what we talked about. This is a very intriguing moment of the interrogation, as the suspect's state of mind seems to be in two places at once. He is undoubtedly clinging on to hope, made evident by his outright refusal to admit involvement, yet he still mm -hmm. has situational awareness. He knows mm -hmm. deep down that his act isn't being bought, giving reason for his guilt in requesting food. He would have been starving at this moment, yet his primary concern was how he would be perceived while eating. He is caught between wanting to satisfy his hunger and trying to <laughs> appear so guilt-ridden by the circumstances <laughs> that he doesn't even care about his hunger. No, I don't care. True, he's so hungry. Your appetite at this point doesn't matter. Really, I come in here, I sat to explain to you what the evidence was. Um, had a discussion. Actually, I don't oh, think there's any animosity. We're writing that down. So we had a discussion about what the case facts are, and that was it. So it doesn't matter to me if you, if you eat or not, but it was a legitimate offer. If you want something, I'll arrange for you to get it. There's no issues that way. But <laughs> well, you read too much into it, man. Overthink till your brain melts. You want something to eat? Star. Something to eat, yes. Get, get him a brick. Look at me. Take it easy. <laughs> Wash your hand. Oh my god. In reality, no food was coming. The suspect <gasps> had it right when he stated that the investigator didn't care about his hunger and he wasn't about to go out of his way to get a takeaway meal for a child killer. The Mutt and Jeff <laughs> technique, although very well executed, Starve. was unsuccessful on this occasion. 54 minutes later. <gasps> hey Mike, I'm a pretty get down to the facts kind of guy. I'm sure you've uh, realized that from our brief encounter earlier. Oh right? my God. This is not rocket science. I've got what Terry Lynn has told me this afternoon. I've got you. This is your opportunity, Terry Lynn's sitting right here. Tell us she's a liar. Tell her. You've had no problem at saying with her out over in the room. Terry's a liar. Yeah. That's what disgusting. You're disgusting. I wanna spit you in his eye. I don't need to look at her. You haven't been looking at anyone. Yeah, look at someone. Make eye contact. See, Mike, you know I was hurt when I walked in here, okay? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pull any punches here, okay? I'm not gonna try and kiss your ass, all right? Detective Smith's behavior in the following moments is not associated with any techniques nor strategies. He knows the suspect's inclination is virtually set and unlikely to be influenced any further from this point onward. The following onslaught doesn't have any tactical purposes related to the investigation. The detective has understandably become emotionally invested in the case and proceeds to give the prime suspect the psychological grilling he deserves. I mean, let's face it. I'm a cop, all right? And the last five weeks I've been trying to find out who killed an eight-year-old girl, okay? And I know the guys from Behavioral Sciences, they got their thing, they're trying to understand why, that's what they do. You guys all work together. Yeah, we do. They're good people, they know their job very well. And sure as hell, I'd like to know why, all right? I'd like to think that we don't have people walking around our communities who just because they're bored on an afternoon say, hey, why don't we grab that girl and, uh, and rape and murder her, okay? I'd like to think that we live in a community where people think a little bit more about what they're going to do than that. 
you think you're coming off as an innocent guy? Do you think you're looking like somebody who's been wrongfully accused? <laughs> Idiot. You're gonna see it however you want to see it. He thinks he's so smart. My lawyer, or the lawyer, instructed me to just say... Yeah, I know, Mike. I know what your lawyer instructed you to say. But that doesn't make you an innocent man. That makes you a man who's saying, holy fuck, what am I going to do now? He's clearly Nothing so guilty. Is going to change your opinion. So I might as well just follow the lawyer's advice. Well... You're right there, Mike. Nothing you do is going to get you walking out of this police station tonight without being charged with murdering Tori Stafford. You're right. You know how much media coverage this has. You know what the newspapers are going to do with this and to your family tomorrow. Okay? You think the cops. We're going to be talking to everybody you ever spoke to in your life. That's nothing compared to what the media is going to be doing. This is a huge story for them. This is the next Paul Bernardo. Whether you like it or not, a girl and a guy kidnapping an eight-year-old girl and murdering her. That's one of the most sensational things that have happened in this province since Bernardo and Carla. It's going to be a frenzy, and you and I both know that. Three you know hours. What a psychopath is, Mike? I have never met one. Well, I just met one tonight. Oh sh. I just find it funny how you can, how you can go full sure on something when you don't know. Well, Mike, when somebody tells me that they were present when a man killed an eight-year-old girl. <laughs> Somebody told you that. Mm hmm She did. Okay. When that happens, okay, we don't say, oh, well, maybe after, uh, maybe after we go golfing for the week, we'll go and see Mike and see what he has to say. He's getting angry because he's hungry. No, so let's just pick him up and then say, yep, you did it. Because that's obviously got to be the right way to go about things. Oh, because you care so much about doing the right thing. So, the last thing I cover off with everybody I talk to in situations like this, Mike, is pretty straightforward, okay? Rodney Stafford and Tara McDonald have to be notified about this. Okay. First question out of their mouth is going to be, what? Did they say why they did it? I'm sure one of those two will have the answer for you. Why somebody would do it. What are you getting at, Mike? What are you throwing out there for me, buddy? Don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're going to talk to no. them anyways. You know what, Mike? If you're going to claim you have no involvement whatsoever, don't play games with me and, and throw out little hints and see, see nope. what comes of it. There's no game. There's no little okay. hints. There's nobody involved in this except for you and Terry Lynn. Two hours, 30 We're minutes. Done. Is that what you said to Tori before you killed her? We're done? Funny man. Funny man. That's what you think this is, is funny man? I think you're a funny man. I think you're a cold-blooded killer. Because you and I haven't spent too much more time now than you forced Tori Stafford to spend in your car. Oh my god. You could have let her out anywhere along that route. You could have, you could have killed her without sexually assaulting her. And that's what I wanted to sit across from tonight. See what it's like to sit across from a guy who, when he abducts an eight-year-old girl, is so turned on by it that before he kills her, he has to have sex with her. So if you ask me why I'm sitting in this room, I'm sitting in this room for Tori. Making you squirm, putting you through some of the grief that you put her through. That's why I'm in here, Mike. 
and I'm having a good time. I want to be a bad cop. You are a sick puppy, Michael. I want to be a detective. Eight years old, Mike. Eight years old, buddy. All she wanted to do was go home and have a little party for her friends because her mom just redecorated her room for her. That's purely evil, bud. This is exactly what the judge is going to see. That's what you are. No remorse. No remorse. No empathy. No empathy. No Disgusting. Nothing. Just a waste of air. Nice thing about the place you're going to be spending. Ooh. A good chunk of your life is they actually have glass cells. So you and Bernardo can make googly eyes at each other all day, whatever you guys do in there. So it's nice meeting you, Mikey. Enjoy the rest of your life. This is the kind of room you're going to be spending it in. Slap him. Three years later. And it was all for this little girl right here. Not just Tori, but for every little child in Canada that doesn't deserve what happened to her. Good evening. Aww. Thanks for joining us. 31-year-old Michael Rafferty has been found guilty of murdering, kidnapping, and sexually assaulting 8-year-old Tori Stafford. It's been 10, nearly 10, very long weeks of trial in London, which is where Laura Zilke has been covering this story since the very beginning. In the courtroom, when the verdict was read out, there was a collective sigh of yes for each time one of those guilty verdicts was read out through friends and family. That came with the reading of each verdict. Guilty of first degree, guilty of abduction, and guilty of sexual assault. Lawyers from both sides of the story came out to speak with us as well. Their reaction, everyone appreciating that justice was done here, and every one of them also thanking the work that the jury had to do for having to sit through this case for, as you mentioned, Carolyn, almost 10 weeks. It's been a long and difficult trial for everybody. The trial is finally over, so that's a good thing. But the this verdict means lost. that the jury has found that Michael Rafferty did kidnap, sexually assault, and murder Victoria Stafford and our thoughts are with Victoria's family. Is it a hard decision for you to take cases like this? It's never easy, but uh, honestly, I mean, somebody has to take them. It's, uh, I get asked that question more often than almost anything else. How can you do a case like this? How can you defend such a person? The reality of it is that everybody in our system deserves a strong, uh, proper and effective defense. Even, even before going into the courtroom, there was really a sense of, of excitement. Uh, I think a lot of the family thought that because the verdict did come so quickly, just a, just over a day of deliberations, they be truly believed that this was going to be a guilty verdict. Then going into the courtroom, that simply continued. The relief that went over the uh, it, it was really almost un unbelievable to hear the, the sighs that went through everyone in that courtroom. Carolyn. Both Michael Rafferty and Terry Lynn McClintock were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for 25 years. I'm so glad, I'm so glad that that girl also got the same, same punishment. She thought, she probably thought that snitching on him was going to like, re like lower her sentence or something or let her like get away or whatever, but. Mm-mm.